Back and thanks for staying with the agenda. Now, the media has a powerful influence on how people view the world. It's often the only link to events happening around us and elsewhere. With the escalating conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the media uh, has been there to bring that news uh, story to audiences around the world. But how has media uh, reportage on the story uh, gone? For more on this, we are joined by Media Monitoring Africa Director William Bird. Uh, welcome to you and thanks for making the time to speak to us. Uh, uh, quite a global story, this one. Um, how has the media covered the Russia-Ukraine conflict in terms of framing it? Well, good morning. I guess the answer to that is, is that some of them have done well and some of them have done really badly. You know, there's, there's so many media now uh, reporting on this. It's easily the biggest story in Europe and, you know, in the, for, for Western media, it's, it's a, a war on their doorstep. Um, and so, you know, they, they, they've been covering it non-stop, uh, wall-to-wall coverage, you know, so you can know that at least it's been uh, extensive. Obviously, there are going to be problems when you're covering a conflict like this, the issues of, of where uh, the, the media take their views from, which sources they take. But in addition to that, we know that outside of the traditional and more credible media and reputable media, there are also those that are operating on social media that are putting out you know, almost an endless amount of content suggesting all sorts of other things that are going on. And inside of that, you've then got people that are actively pushing mis- and disinformation. So for media to cover this, you know, while on, on some level it's, it's made it easier because of the, the use and advent of social uh, media, on, on a number of levels, it introduces a whole number of different challenges for media to verify, make sure that content that they're getting is actually from where it says it is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it poses a range of different challenges for media. And on top of that, then, you know, we've already seen the the, 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 the outcry and anger, appropriately so, about uh, how some of the media commentators, commentators and media houses have have talked about this as being, you know, more horrific because it involves white people, basically. And you just t touched on disinformation there. Just a few days ago, the EU President Ursula von der Leyen announced that they were blocking media such as Russia Today and mentioned a few other outlets saying that they're concerned that they'll be sending out propaganda as opposed to the true story. How have you engaged with this development? So look, it's an interesting thing, you know, when you, if you talk about credible media, like the SABC has to adhere to its editorial policies. In addition to those editorial policies, there's also the Broadcasting um, Complaints Commission of South Africa, and there's the Broadcasters Code. So any person <clears throat> in South Africa, if they feel that you've, <clears throat> excuse me, fallen foul of that, uh, of that code, they can lodge a complaint and they can go through various processes and make sure that the SABC is held accountable, right? So there's a response to those things and it means that, that SABC can't just make stuff up. Now, the, the problem with when you get media that are theoretically reputable or that, that are well resourced is that they have an air of credibility. And in fact, what you find with many of those is that they then don't adhere to any of the same acceptable standards of international journalistic practice. So they don't a claim or they might say that they adhere to things that are accurate and balanced and fair but really what they're doing is, is just making stuff up and those people then undermine the credibility of all media so for the EU to have taken this decision I mean it's a, it's a, it's really a, um, a remarkable decision for them to have said we're going to block those channels on our local uh, broadcast services because we think that they're putting out propaganda and disinformation I mean that's a it's an it's an incredible thing to have happened. You know, the EU has a history of of being very much forward looking in terms of uh, promoting freedom of expression, making sure that you find ways of of enabling it to flourish, promoting diversity of views, etc. So this really does give you an idea that not only of the the depth of the crisis from their perspective, I guess, but also uh, the, it shines a very stark light on that that issue that says. They're credible media, and this is and this is how we know this. And then they're media that aren't credible, and and this is how we know this. So if you bring it back to, um, you know, to to our continent and to some of the challenges here, there's certain countries on our continent where if their state media put out a story, you're not going to believe that, you know, because we know that it isn't controlled by uh, and and adhering to good journalistic practice. They are pursuing an active agenda to protect 
for example, Eswatini. You know, they're not going to be telling you something that is accurate and balanced and fair. And so you would say, well, that, that probably doesn't constitute news. And, and that's where you start to run into all sorts of challenges. Yeah. Another story only broke last Thursday, but just have you been able to measure South Africans' engagement in this story? How, how, have they demonstrated the significance of this event and what it means for South Africans? Well, I think that we really saw some peaks uh, in coverage and, and uh, you know, engagement specifically on social media, although, again, that's, that's tricky right? because you, you, you're determining it on, on accounts and on hashtags and those kinds of things. So, of course, it's, it's big uh, globally. It doesn't seem to have featured as highly in our own local scenario. I mean, it is on all of our news agendas and it is on all of the various... Uh, trends, pages, and other things, but you know, understandably, we are keeping a lot of our local stories uh, close to heart. So I would suggest that over certainly over the last yeah. couple of days, you know, Ricky Rick's uh, tragic passing is is probably getting more attention um, and, and focus from South African uh, social media users than, than than the war in Ukraine. Let's talk some more about balancing that big global story with local events. As you say, Ricky Rick has been one of the top ones. But bread and butter issues such as unemployment, the petrol price increase, um, uh, crime in the country. Ha have we been engaging sufficiently with this? Has media been uh, giving fair, balanced reportage? Well, I mean, that's always going to be tricky. And in, and in South Africa, we always argue that I'm not sure that we get our, our balance right necessarily all of the time anyway. So we know that there are existing biases. So at any one time, we know that the big stories that are going to get covered are going to come from Gauteng, the Western Cape, and KZN. And it really has to be an exceptional story if it's going to be making headline news in uh, from any of the other kind of provinces, you know, because those, those provinces, they generally don't feature in our news diet as much. Uh, partly it's about you know rural issues and power and money and all of those kinds of things, but it's also about resources of news organizations. So it is going to be a lot easier for news organizations to be getting content that is really excellently newsworthy. You know, you're having bombs flying and buildings falling and tanks and, you know, it, it's really compelling news footage. And it is a key and critical story. That's going to be a lot easier to come by than, for example, uh, you know, a whole range of stories on what the increase to the new minimum wage means for ordinary South Africans. And what does it mean for, you know, the petrol price uh, it, it increase? What does that mean for ordinary South Africans, for example? And what are the, you know, our latest uh, issues around dealing with our, 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 the, our existing health challenges or, you know, various uh, health facilities? So those things are always going to be a, a challenge and a balance. And, and so what the SABC has to do is you have a very clear mandate uh, in your editorial policies that sets out you know how you need to try and balance these things and cover them and you have to try and eff effectively cover all of them but then the SABC has hopefully you know enough of a, a range of services to make sure that the needs and interests of all people are covered outside of the public broadcaster I'm not so sure that that that's as easy to find that and strike that balance uh, precisely because those broadcasters have even less resources and you know the reality is, is they're going to tend to go for the big story that's there. Another area that's come under the spotlight is South Africa's foreign policy and the uh, different messages that came out of the Department of International Relations, uh, uh, the department saying something and the president saying something else. How should the media have covered this, especially considering uh, uh, that we need to stay within the realm of the Film and Publications Amendment Act. Uh, were we able to do this? So there are two issues there. I think the, the first is how should the media cover that? They need to explore and expose the, the contradictions and the hopelessly embarrassing position that our government is taking. You know, they, there's not a clear, coherent uh, policy, and, and our media need to make sure that they reflect that. Uh, you know that's that then falls on our government, and uh, you know, and our political uh, experts need to respond to those and engage with the, the various uh, uh, issues that that need to be un unpacked about that. Getting to the Film and Publications uh, Amendment Act, that has been um, it has now come into force, 
And there are some worrying uh, elements about that act, including the, the, the issue of, of the exception for news, for news media. So the, we are hoping that there are going to be regulations that will come out that will provide that exception. But as we understand it, the exception isn't uh, in place, which means that if, for example, some of the broadcasters are, are going to be broadcasting some of the, the dramatic war footage, uh, there's a chance that they would be asked to submit that for pre-publication uh, classification, which of course would be utterly ludicrous and a gross invasion <clears throat> of the of freedom of expression for the news organizations. So I can't see the FPB doing it, but that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be immediately withdrawn. So you know, it, it's something that it's a it's a critical issue that we are currently seized with, uh, engaging with various lawyers to address, and, and you know, we'll uh, watch the space. If there's things that need to be, uh, if there's action that needs to be taken, we'll you can bet that we'll be on it, and we'll let the media know. William, I have to let you go, but just one last one. The uh, conflict is clearly escalating. Um, just in terms of going forward. How can the media uh, start to correct the errors of when the story was breaking? Well, I think they need to make sure that they go back to their basics, you know, make sure that you are giving information that's accurate, that's credible, and that's fair, and that you expose, that you make sure that you check your issues before they go there. So it's better to be right than to be first, especially in this day and age, and certainly for, for the public broadcaster to make sure that they say, as there's a new development, is this newsworthy? What does it mean for South Africa and our audiences? And if it has grave and significant implications, then we need to make sure we're covering and reporting that. If it isn't, then, you know, we can lead with another equally critically important local story around you know, dealing with some of, our, some of our criminal actors. So I guess the short answer is make sure that we do the best jobs we possibly can as journalists and media practitioners. William Bird is the director for Media Monitoring Africa, but we also asked our viewers, uh, thanks for talking to us, William, but we also asked our viewers to engage with us on this conversation on uh, uh, social media, and a tweet has come through. Let's take a look at it. Togo saying, it could have been avoided before it started. Now the West is mobilized together to support one country, which will lead back to days of the Cold War between the West and the East. That's a big concern, isn't it? We've seen racism in action and how the Western media reports urgent mediation is required to end this. United States President Joe Biden says the U.S. will ban Russian flights from its airspace.